Hello, my name is Professor Matthew Schmidt and I'd like to welcome you to genetics. In today's session, we're going to start talking about what really should be called molecular genetics. We're going to start at the beginning, as you would expect, with DNA structure and replication, with the idea that DNA is the genetic material. Now, I suspect you're saying, yes, we know that, but most genetics courses are taught in what's usually referred to as an historical fashion. In other words, most people, even who are not uh, biology students today, know about DNA, but Mendel didn't know about it, and Sutton and Morgan didn't know about it. So in other words, all of the genetics we've done so far, and we've done quite a bit, it was all done and can be fully understood without knowing anything about DNA or the chemical nature of the gene. So now we're ready to, in essence, to say, if we were going forth in historical time, and it was about 1925, you know, we're at a point where we're ready to begin to explore what's going on at the molecular level. Um, depending on your course, it may or may not go into this part so much. We're going to look at some experiments that help to elucidate the fact that DNA is in fact the genetic material. Um, I suspect most courses do expect you to know this, so if not, I guess you don't have to. So basically, this is a little bit of a recap of, of some of the things I just said. You know, structure and function are so intimately intertwined, not just in biology, but particularly in biology. So we've learned a lot about the function. In other words, we've learned how to predict the results of crosses, and we know how to map genes. We, really, ultimately, we do have to relate that to the structure of what the genetic material really is. So as I said, up until now, everything we've talked about, uh, about has not taken into account this chemical nature. Another thing just to keep in the back of your head is that it's also not taken into account how genotype uh, determines phenotype. In other words, it's all well and good for Mendel to have said, okay, well, Big P makes purple flowers. I'm not criticizing him, but he had no idea what Big P was, and he had no idea, you know, certainly how whatever it was translated the purpleness into reality. So these are all questions we're going to um, we're going to discuss as time goes by. As I say, it's time to find out and get to the bottom of all this. So before put yourself in the position of a scientist who's thinking about this, what are the requirements if we're looking for a molecule for the genetic material? Well, based on everything we know, it has to be able to store and express information. That's probably obvious, but what I mean by that is there are lots of ways to to store information, but uh, we didn't discuss this. But take a molecule like starch. It's just a repeating of glucose over and over and over and over again. Um, there's really not a lot of potential for information storage in that type of molecule. So we have to be able to envision a system. Uh, think of if you were looking at a Blu-ray DVD. It's a, a digital system, right? Zeros and ones are the code that we're using, the symbols that we're using. So there are loads of ways to store information, but we need to find a molecule that can do it. Furthermore, it has to be able to replicate itself. Remember, it was known that how the chromosomes behaved during mitosis and meiosis, and it was very clear that whatever molecule this was, a copy has to be made of it. So it has to be able to, to make that copy. And this is somewhat redundant with what's already had been said, but there has to be a lot of variation. And what I mean by that is in the molecule, we have to be able to account for not only the fact that there's variation within a species at particular traits and even amongst different traits in that species, but since we've seen that fundamentally genetic processes work similarly, whether it's a pea or a fruit fly or, you know, whatever organism, a mouse, um, you know, ultimately, we have to be able to account for all of the genetic variation in the biological world. So there has to be a ridiculous capacity for differences in the information that's stored. And I only mention mutation here just because, you know, we're going to have big talks about mutation. But mutation just means a change. And it was known even before it was understood what DNA was that changes could occur. Remember, we said that the 
white eyed allele in the fruit fly was a mutation of the normal uh, wild type red eyed allele. So in other words, it was known that these changes could take place. We have to choose a molecule that has a capacity for this type of change, okay? So when I ask here, what do we know so far? I don't mean us, you and me. I mean, in about 1925, uh, what was known given Mendel and Sutton and some of the early fly work, etc. So one thing Mendel said, right, was that genes are units of information. So that's for sure. We further know that they are physically located on chromosomes. In fact, you could say that those are the two major, you know, we had talked about Mendel and chromosomes fusing together conceptually, allowing us to do things like make maps of genes and understand what those maps really mean. Um, something we haven't talked about but was known is that biochemists had examined chromosomes and sort of in a bulk way determined that they were made of proteins and DNA. So DNA was known about, it just wasn't thought to be particularly important, which sounds strange now, but it was found in every chromosome and it was really thought to be part of like a scaffolding material. As far as anyone knew, proteins did, you know, being enzymes, they did all the work and well, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself, but since it's known that the genes were on chromosomes, right? And the chromosomes were made up about half DNA and half protein, it was really widely assumed in the early days that protein was the genetic material. The reason is because uh, DNA, as we're going to see, but it only has four different bases that can, that can create the variability, whereas proteins have 20 different amino acids. So in theory, you can have a lot more variability with protein, but just remember that DVD. There's only two symbols there that can encode the whole five hours of some epic movie in high definition. So you really don't need a lot of um, subunits or symbols in a code in order to in, in order to encode a lot of information. But it was assumed that proteins were the thing. There was a lot of variety of proteins. It was incorrect, but it was thought in the early days that DNA might just be a repeating polymer, almost like starch. And the fact that proteins were catalytic, a lot of uh, people thought, they, they described the genetic material almost as like a super enzyme. Somehow it was, you know, it, it may sound odd now, but that's, every, all biochemists were into protein in those days. So, turns out they were wrong. How did we find that out? So it all started with an experiment, an experiment, excuse me, performed by a gentleman named uh, Frederick Griffith. He was a microbiologist studying uh, infection. So Griffith's experiment is usually thought of as the first indication that DNA was the genetic material. Although you should be clear that he didn't actually say that. You'll see as we go through it. Because really what he was doing, he was working with bacterial pneumonia using mice as a model organism. And he performed what's now a famous experiment that gave a clue when people thought about it later as to what the nature of the gene really was. So let's just look at what he was doing. He really wasn't a geneticist. Um, he was trying to figure out various things about uh, infection using this pneumonia. So first of all, he used a bacteria called Streptococcus pneumoniae. Um, it is one that often still today causes uh, pneumonia. Uh, other versions of Streptococcus cause like strep throat. So it's a fairly common pathogen as well as a normal member of the bacteria in, in most people. But in the case of Griffith, he had identified two strains of this bacteria. A strain is sort of like a subspecies, a particular um, line of the bacterium that has certain characteristics. There was the S strain and there was the R strain. And he named it S because when grown right on a plate, you could see that it was smooth and shiny. I forget if the S is for smooth. Yeah, for smooth. Um, but in other words, he could tell the difference just by looking at it, not even under a microscope. It also turned out, so the R was rough, in other words, 